One of the most extreme things I just heard was, I think it was last week, that heat wave killed thousands of Indians and the roads were melting. Possibly what the pivotal turning point for us will be is that climate change, Mother Earth, Father Son, is saying to us, wake up, uh, we are go you know, you're going to experience mass death from climate change. And to have respect for the very environment that we inhabit and to have respect for all of life and each other. And as long as we're going to be having endless wars, and that's what you're speaking about, uh, and we don't have a way to remedy that, we are Really, it's, it's a genocide on the entire planet right now. So I think that we really need to take a look at what is genocide and how can we move out of the condition. Um, I, I was just at a Meaningful World and they brought forth their Mind Body Echo Spirit Festival and the woman that was the keynote speaker, uh, she was very dynamic, Lorreen Schussel uh, from Teachers College, Columbia University. Oh, wait a moment, Barbara Wallace. Uh, she brought forth the new Unified Health Psychology and Healing Global Trauma from Racism and or Oppression integrating African and indigenous perspectives. And it was very, very interesting because most of us do not realize that our um, European ancestors came here with uh, the, you were speaking about Catholic religion, Christianity, but especially the Pope who deemed a doctrine of discovery and with that, a papal bull was signed, and it still holds to this day that the Native Americans, the people that were living here in a sustainable way for centuries, they had their communities, they had families, they had their uh, spiritual practices, were actually deemed non-human because they were not baptized by the Catholic Church. And by being non-human, then they could be slaughtered. And that's really the basis of the genocide that I'm aware of. I mean, there is Native American woman right here who has much more uh, knowledge than I do. Uh, I'm a new student to the subject matter. But I sense that um, we all should really be paying attention to this because it's affecting our lives every day when we look into the news and uh, we have to recognize that there's a fear of the other and to overcome the initial fear. You know, we are human beings on a planet that's racing around in a universe and it, would, it's, it could be a paradise and the way we're allowing it to go, it's turning into something very different, you know, very different than our, the paradise that it has the ability to be. Okay, we're going to take a water break and that makes me realize how precious our water is and how fortunate we are to have fresh drinking water still. And it's quickly. All the way from the Hutchinson. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this water. Do we do we know where our water comes from? And a lot of people would say it's the tap, but it goes a lot further than the tap, right? <laughs> that tap actually has a source. Hudson River Valley, and our Hudson River actually comes from the um, Adirondacks a little lake, the Lake of Tears, in a beautiful, pristine area. It's the very source of our Hudson River. I don't think this is Hudson River water, though. I think this is maybe Croton Reservoir. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's really good exercise to think where does our water flow from and to really have gratitude that we have clean water. Right now there's so many people that are suffering that don't and becoming very ill and dying. So thank you for the clean water. <laughs> Cheers. It's actually very it is, yeah. Yeah. They haven't put they haven't over chlorinated it. And they also put fluoride in saying it's good for our teeth, but so Rick, what brings you here? My name is Rick Hill. I know Barbara Jimmins from Judson and uh I mean around the uh, Grand Village and then uh, yeah. Judson Memorial. Judson Memorial Church, a great church. Yeah, recognizes church. everyone, atheists as well. And you don't have to join, you can just be there. Our lady minister, Donna Scopper, has written 25 books, has a PhD, and is married to a Jewish you man. You might want to check that out. There is a kid, uh, three kids, both Jewish and Christian. One of the sons is married to a woman who just became a rabbi. <laughs> and indeed, it's a very eclectic place devoted to uh, social justice and promotion of the arts. Even partially funded with uh, John D. Rockefeller money uh, to get it started, that in Riverside oh, Church. I didn't know that. Along with many, but primarily many small donations, and it was supposed to be all things to everybody on the south side of uh, Washington Square Park. It's not a proselytizing church, so right. you can't, you know, you know, it's, it's there for anybody who wants to. But my, uh, uh, let's see, and I know Beth Lamont from Marxist circles, uh, you know, she used to have this annual Christmas party at the Marxist Center there on the 23rd or 14th or whatever. Maybe you were, some of you were there. And, um, and then um, I know her from Richard Wolff, Marxist lectures at Brecht and uh, New School in Judson. Uh, and Rick Wolf just spoke at the yeah, Judson. Judson yeah. Were you there? No, but no? Uh, there's, it competes with, his uh, lecture competes with dead darlings in the balcony of Judson Church, emceed by this woman named uh, Amanda Duarte, a totally over-the-top funny lady who reads from the New York Times and uh, brings everybody to laughter and uh, throws candy out to the audience. <laughs> And yeah, it's wonderful. And, you uh, can keep that. So Richard Wolf uh, is very compelling, but he's he can't compete with uh, Amanda Duarte. Uh, you can you can catch his Dead Darlings on YouTube. Maybe it's uh, just coincidentally, it's these uh, theater types. There's this saying, "Kill your babies," you know, sacrifice the part for the whole. And so they end up with all these parts, and so they they get up and they uh, present these parts that maybe didn't make it into the book or the play or the musical, and they're very, very. This is what he's speaking funny about. <laughs> the dead darlings. They're like the uh, novels. The um, I think they're the novels of the writers that are still in Greenwich Village. They show up, yeah. And it's a very popular, I haven't gone myself. Well, but novels and parts of uh, screenplays and movies screenplays. and, and uh, gags and funny things. Uh, I just want to hold this it's up. It's fun. Uh, uh, yeah. Pamela just gave me this. is uh, Corliss's book, The Philosophy of Humanism. Uh, a great, and there's Corliss on the back. Um, my my uh, background is, uh, Kind of questioning what is a human. I mean, if you're going to talk about humanism, then the question is, what is a human? And maybe this book, <laughs> the point of departure, is that a human is just a human, uh, and and when you die, that's it. And it's waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Uh, I've got a bachelor's in philosophy, and then I learned uh, a technique of meditation from India. Uh, in the Himalayas in uh, January 1669 in Cambridge, Mass. And then I became a teacher of it, and I taught that for 20 years throughout the U.S. and overseas. And uh, I haven't taught for about the last 20 years, but I, I may get try to get recertified and return to it. It was very fulfilling. Uh, um, actually, uh, 
six million people who have learned this particular technique in 50 years uh, from people like me or my teacher. That's tremendous. Or, uh, or some of teacher? uh, other teachers. My teacher was His Holiness Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who has mm. a degree in mathematical physics from Allahabad University and was the uh, favored student and secretary of a very great light in the Himalayas, who Sarvapelli Radhakrishnan, who Corliss Lamont knew because he was a philosopher oh. as well as president of India. Uh, Radhakrishnan addressed Maharishi's teacher as Vedanta incarnate, and Vedanta refers to this highest state of consciousness where where it's your experience, this uh, famous saying, I am that, thou art that, all is nothing but that, that alone is, where that is pure consciousness without an object or bliss, infinite. You, you still see boundaries, but what dominates is the essential constituent of the boundaries, which is what Einstein called unified field. So what Einstein calls unified field is infinite unbounded basis for all the boundaries, the whole field of multiplicity and variety and gradation and change and time space. Uh, the basis of that is infinite, unbounded, absolute, never changing. So the never changing basis of the ever changing, sort of like the ground is the basis of all of the different vegetation above the ground. So that is the same field uh, in, in a uh, objective world as subjectively uh, when people talk about being big B or self big S or consciousness big C, consciousness without an object. Sometimes they call it samadhi, satori, nirvana, kingdom of heaven within. And that's, you can access it temporarily. And then you can stabilize it and can be there 24-7. And when, when you're there 24-7, you're in a fifth neurophysiological state of consciousness. And just to, just to summarize it, there are these seven major neurophysiological states of consciousness defined uh -huh. by stable, the four stable functions in the body. So hmm. it's not arbitrary. It's not like I can say we have five fingers and you can say, well, that's your opinion. <laughs> we really only have uh, three fingers, you know. So this, this is not speculation. <laughs> this is reality. So there's deep sleep, dreaming, waking. Then there's this hmm. fourth state, which I learned in 1969, I became a teacher in 1970, and I was able to teach other people this technique because it's effortless, and mechanical, systematic, uh, automatic, uh, effortless, and uh, but profound and, and deep. Uh, the rest is much deeper than deep sleep, the alertness is much greater than waking state, and the stress release is much greater than in dreaming. Mm. So it's kind of a paradoxical state, because normally when you're resting, you're not alert, when you're alert, you're not resting. And then when that state stabilized, that's enlightenment, that's self-realization, that's cosmic consciousness. But it's still duality, it's me and, the, and I, I'm kind of, I'm no longer identified with my mind and like ego senses, my you know, face, my emotions, my moods, my past, present, future. Those aren't me any more than, say I'm an actor in a hundred movies. I'm not the parts in a hundred movies. I'm our table or whatever. So, uh, so in that state, the digestion takes over and produces a better product out of what is eaten. And usually the best product is ovum and semen. But this takes it to a little bit higher level, halogis and soma, and that's a neurotransmitter which allows us to have celestial perception. Hitherto, celestial perception was limited to artists, musicians, poets, mystic saints, and they, they said it's like seeing through golden glasses. And they gave great, you know, uh, art, but it seemed like it was inaccessible to the general population. But uh, my teacher and his teacher in this ancient tradition say it's indeed, it's, it's uh, our birthright to be enlightened and it's our duty, and that means fully enlightened. So what happens is I reach this fifth state, I'm enlightened, and then this uh, neurotransmitter begins to be produced in my body, and then I, I'm enlightened in this state of bliss, and I see the world on a celestial level. And then just in conclusion, what the next last step is, since that's du still duality, there's a final step where it's unity. And I see the, the book on the same infinite level that way back in the fourth Wait, state I realized I was. Unity, that, did you say? That's unity consciousness. That has, each of these states has neurophysiological markers in terms of the stable functions. And then what are the stable functions? They're, they're the 
basically the breath, the blood, the, the brain, and the heart. The, 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 the brain, the coherence of brain function, side to side, up and down, front and back, and phase, frequency, and amplitude of mostly alpha and theta. The, the breathing, which is metabolic rate respiration. The, the heart, which is cardiac output. And then the blood content, the pH of the blood, whether it's alkaline or acidic. Alkalinity is a condition of longevity and enlightenment. So uh, recently, a, an extraordinary thing happened, uh, well, relatively recently, 1994. Yes. But uh, he gave a seminar at the NYU Cantor Film Center in May 12th of 2012. He being, he being a MD with a PhD in neurophysiology from MIT who wrote a 600-page illustrated book, which I have, not widely available, but it is extraordinary. Mm. This man, this author, who happens to be Lebanese, married to a French woman, lives in Holland, has two daughters. He has a foot in this Vedic knowledge. Veda means knowledge in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is his unique knowledge. And then he has a foot in medicine and neurophysiology. So he wrote this book with the cooperation and inspiration of Maharishi. And afterwards, Maharishi said, yes, you've nailed it. The thesis of the book is that 40 aspects of Veda have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the 40 aspects of the human physiology from the gross anatomy to the DNA. So the entire mm. Veda, rather than quaint hymns to the lesser gods of a primitive nature religion or, or poetry or some gobbledygook from India and, and uh, you know, uh, sort of just this mismatch of incomprehensibility, is the software and, and and uh, operating system and the body is the hardware. So all it needs to do is be applied in, in the entire population of what is it? Seven billion humans will, ra will rise to a real good level of humanity. Uh, and then a lot of these problems will just dissolve. Sort of like turn on the light, the darkness dissipates. Still. So when you're speaking about this, I, can, I think of um, our science and yeah, how science, oh, yeah, yeah. how science is being taught today. And it seems to me that when we celebrated Darwin Day, um, it turns out that Darwin had a spiritual counterpart. I'm trying to remember his name. But um, our education system seemed to have bought in on Darwin's theory of evolution. And that is omitting spirit. So now we're in this situation of opening up to the aspect that we all have spirit and we're all connected by spirit. And um, when we omit that, there's a loss of identity. And one of the greatest threats right now, I, I was at a lecture by someone who um, serves a number of departments here in New York City on identity loss, identity theft. And it's growing rapidly through the um, internet. You know. But um, I, I sense that our population at large has lost their identity. Mm. And what people like ourselves, like what you're saying, what Donna might have to say, what Ron, you know, any one of us who d decides to, Sharif, what you have to say, um, it's, we're, we're finding our authentic self. And once we do that, then all we need to be able to do is to relax, breathe, and be that, and allow our mind, body, authentic self to be what you're speaking about. So in science, they're starting to look into quantum physics. And the little bit I know about it is that they're saying it's a state that artists and uh, meditators will go into, um, composers of music. Um, quantum physics is a state of consciousness that is beyond fear. Um, and that's pretty much we're in a fear-based society that we're pretty much um, addicted to watching a media that causes fear as soon as you look at this and shuts down what you're speaking about. You know? So I think that we're at a time right now that we're coming together and we're sharing 
all our ways of getting beyond the fear and the um, social conditioning that we are different from each other, that we all share a common spirit. We have different cultures and to embrace them, and I, I find it very interesting that we have different cultures. It doesn't scare me, you know. What scares me is the, um, the extreme fanatics that are uh, being equipped with deadly, you know, deadly weapons. That's scary. But um, it's very interesting what you had to say. If enough of us are practicing what we know is being ourselves, that that actually has a momentum to um, turn that energy around. You're saying that war actually, was there a ceasefire during this time? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, war That's what we need. Yeah, yeah. War fatalities. Yeah. <laughs> Because everybody's living in the field, right? It's, I mean, we know that at certain, like Christmas time or, or on a sunny day, everybody feels better. It's just a spontaneous thing. And it must translate into some kind of quantifiable. And then um, when I was attending this um, age hop meaningful world, as you're saying, th this has done research into trauma and trauma that is intergenerational. So another aspect of this buying into the fear-based reality is that we ourselves have experienced trauma without recognizing it. It really hasn't been diagnosed. Now they're starting to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder. And someone at this uh, festival was saying that we have a culture of post-traumatic stress disorder right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, if that's true, if that's a fact, then it's how do we help each other with healing modalities that are other than fear-based and drug-related? Because when we're taking the drugs, basically, we are not getting to our authentic self. It might be good for a crisis moment, but overall we cannot become addicted to any type of substance that, you know, is altering our minds. So, so it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to consider, but the thing is, is if we can find our, our path, whatever that might be, and be around people who will, and that's what this uh, meaningful world is bringing forth, who will compassionately listen, which is what we're doing right now, validate the experience, whatever that might be. If it's a spiritually enlightened experience, validating, yes, I understand. Or if it's trauma, yes, I understand. Then that person has the ability to move through to the next level of finding, um, finding themselves, really finding a, uh, a peaceful life and harmony. I mean, it might not be every moment, but we have the skill to go back to um, understanding what that can be. You know, um, we have um, a practice that is breathing, getting in touch with our breath, which we forget, and to think in positive affirmations, prayers, some people call them prayers, other people want to call them affirmations, but whatever it is, having our mind, body, and spirit resonate with a positive, holistic, respectful view of each other and one's own life. And so that involves emotional release um, and also forgiveness. Right now, a lot of what's going on is retaliation. Uh, you know, you hit me, so I'm going to hit you back. Um, you destroyed my family, so I'm going to destroy your family. This retaliation. And that's what's bringing us into an endless war. Once we can remove ourselves from the emotional experience of having to retaliate, but we have compassion and empathy for each other, validate whatever the experience is, 
we can move through it. And it's an energetic, a very spontaneous energetic um, experience. And then uh, healing modalities can come from good nutrition, fresh water. Um, it can even come from uh, uh, tinctures that are made of natural substances flowers and nuts and you know but we actually have this potential right now to help heal our families friends community of course they have to be willing there or even through music I mean Donna is the lead drummer of Spirit of Thunderheart and that drum resonates energy that lifts us out of fear, right? Yeah. I mean, so through music, through art, through um, understanding how our mind works, as you're saying, meditation, you know, however we want to phrase it, whatever makes us feel comfortable, whatever pulls us out of fear, anger, that th through trauma, apparently, quite often, we cannot express that experience and that's another way it gets stuck. So we give the person um, a chance to express themselves and help them with uh, terms. So she uses an anger chart and that anger chart shows a lot of different terms and then you can identify, oh, that's how I'm feeling. Yeah. It's like um, when I was very young, I didn't realize, but I was experiencing panic attacks. I didn't know how to put a word to it. And through this workshop, I came to realize, oh, that was panic attack from trauma that I had when I was very young before I had words to express what that was. Yeah. And so I, I actually had a, a connection with it and I was able to express and feel and let go of that and bring in the healing modalities. So if I can do it, I think any one of us can. It's just a willingness to, as you say, be contemplative, be meditative, um, allow ourselves to detach from our social conditioning that says, oh, we are this or that. Yeah. You're speaking about detachment of the physical, yet knowing we are physical. And that's our spirit. That's what I'm understanding. 